Hello and welcome. It's Oliver Time, specifically the Oliver Typewriter number no. 9 from 1916. It is one of my favorite machines simply because the design is so dramatic, so extravagant, that it is impossible to not love it. It charms you like a siren and draws you in. It makes you want to get to know it better. The design is believed to originate from inventor Thomas Oliver, who wanted to make a typewriter that would show you what you typed as you typed it, also known as visible typing. By the time his first design was put into production in 1894, the world had already seen a couple of visible designs from brands such as the Horton, Williams and the Doggerty. But even if Oliver wasn't the first, it was definitely among the trendsetters that made sure that the blind typewriters was a design that had to go. Its most obvious feature is this twin set of towers, or wings, made up by sets of U-bar type arms with slugs, with each slug having three characters, a lowercase, uppercase, and a figure. While a striking and a dramatic look, the design is also arguably one of the reasons why it would ultimately fail. The U-shape allowed the arms to be stacked on top of each other, and the motion to swing down and hit the platen from above allowed the user to see the letter as soon as it hit the paper. This motion made it very efficient in creating imprints on paper, and particularly so for creating stencils. Its efficiency as a stencil machine was actually one of the reasons it remained so popular in offices for so long. Unfortunately, the design also came with some problems. While definitely a visible typewriter, you only had a very narrow gap you could see the paper on. You saw what you just typed, but only the last 10 to 15 letters. Also, it meant that when it became clear that the general customer preferred a four-bank keyboard layout, that is, four rows of keys, Oliver had a problem. To add a full row of keys would require 9 to 10 more type arms, or 4 to 5 more U-bars to be added to each tower making them 30% wider and taller. This was a problem for a machine that was already as big and heavy as the Oliver already was. The brand started out as an American one, specifically from Chicago. It would continue to be so for 30 years before it was bought out by a British company. Under British rule, it would continue the production of the winged towers for a short while, but ultimately even Oliver had to join in on the front strike design. Everywhere you look on the Oliver, you see interesting solutions. While not necessarily unique, Oliver's definitely stands out as a peculiar machine. Take, for example, the return arm, or rather, the lack thereof. Most machines we see have the arm you bend inwards to forward the platen. The Oliver does this instead by pushing the left knob in as you push the carriage back to its beginning of the row. When a mechanism underneath the carriage hits a stopping point, a set of cogs are triggered, which then forwards the plan. The mechanism is quite clever, and even supports using a lever to alter how many rows the platen should forward. A small lever on the front can be pulled out and either lifted or lowered to change the line forwarding to one, two or three lines as you push in the knob. It's worth mentioning, however, that while traditional return arms could be repeatedly actuated to forward the platen over and over, the Oliver's push-in knob only worked once per carriage return. Most old machines I've seen separates the uppercase and the figures on the slugs by either pushing the platen up a little or even more. Say 5mm up gave you uppercase and 10mm up gave you the figures. The Oliver does this instead by having the carriage remain by default in the middle, Pushing caps, or what we later would call shift, push the carriage back. To make numbers or special characters on the Oliver, we push the fig key to actually pull the carriage forward or towards us. Let's do a typing demonstration. First of all, please excuse my technique as I type. My camera setup has a tripod in front of me, which just isn't compatible with having arms that's supposed to reach the keyboard in a comfortable manner. Second of all, Please excuse the camera, as I'd inadvertently managed to set it to overexpose, so everything is a bit bright in this take. Paper is inserted just as it would be on any other machine. This machine, being 106 years old, has by now a very hard platen, meaning it doesn't grip the paper as well as it should anymore. This is easily circumvented by opening the paper release, manually pushing the paper in, and locking it back up. Doing this, the machine feeds the paper just fine from that point. Next, we want to establish margin points. 
On the Oliver, the left margin is set by either pushing in or pulling out a scaled fin on the right underside of the carriage. There is no clear and intuitive way of understanding from the get-go where to push the margin bar to get it where you want, so many, including myself, end up just trying and failing to get the margin point where I want it a couple of times. It is at this point that I realized while filming that I forgot to mention one of the really charming features of the Oliver, namely the pencil holder. To use it, you push it down towards the paper so that the pencil makes contact with the paper. You can then pull the carriage to the side and that way create a completely horizontal line on that point. By forwarding or backing up the platen roll, you can also create vertical lines. Okay, back on topic. We've set the left margin, now we need to set the right margin. This is set by a small metal clip, also located on the right underside of the carriage. Please excuse the shaky handheld camera, but to give you a better view, this is what you're supposed to be looking for. It is simply pulled down to release, and then slid to the sides to where you want it to be. Okay, we're finally ready to type out some letters. So we have our typing result. As you can see, the print is not 100% aligned, nor always perfectly printed, but you have to cut the, this 160 year old machine some slack. Plus, it's most debilitating handicap, having me as its typer. Despite it all, I'd say it prints beautifully, even when I mistype whole words, and with particularly the letter A, with some serious alignment issues. These alignment problems is also one of the drawbacks with the U-shaped type arms. They can be kind of hard to do alignment corrections on. Besides this, we can also see some marks from where the platen has left marks on the paper. This is another effect of the slowly deteriorating rubber on it. It makes me wish there was someone like JJ Short or similar more local to me, so I could revitalize my platens. As a closing point, I would like to demonstrate how the carriage is removed on the Oliver, for the simple reason that it does so brilliantly easy. You simply pull the carriage as far to the left as it can go. Finally, it will hit the right margin point. You then just press the right margin release and continue pulling. When the carriage reaches the end of the rails, the real genius comes out. A small brass clip underneath the carriage. The draw band is attached to this clip, and both above and underneath it are grabbing hooks. These are designed to interact with hooking points both on the frame and the carriage. As you pull the carriage out, this brass hook automatically connects to a point where it will remain, effectively pulling the brass hook out of the carriage. The carriage then slides completely off the rails, and the draw band remains in place. The process is exactly reversible, and remounting the carriage is just a matter of placing it correctly on the rails, holding the carriage release lever in, and sliding it back. In summary then, the Oliver is a very interesting machine for sure. It has an elegant and unique design that makes it nothing like anything else. It has made an appearance in Bram Stoker's Dracula as a young Winona Ryder types out her letter on it, as well as a couple of other movies. One of which I can't recommend watching, as it will haunt your dreams and nightmares for years to come. Its mechanisms are fun to see, because most typewriters do things in their own way, but still closely related to each other. Many things in this machine are unique, and other things are perhaps merely rare, but the sum of everything is both a beautiful and interesting machine. Among all my machines, this is likely the one that sparks the most questions whenever I have visitors. I spent close to 30 hours restoring this, and there are still things to do, but any time spent working on a machine like this is just a joy. I hope you found this video interesting. 
Feel free to leave any questions or suggestions in a comment if you feel there is something missing or something could be improved upon. So until next time, stay happy and stay typing.